Is everybody ready? You ready, Sarah? What's that? <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> <clears throat> ready, Sarah? Record icon. Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. Um, we are now going to call to order the um, regular board meeting of the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District Board of Directors on Monday, July 17th, 2023. And the time is 6.06. .06. Could we please have a roll call? Director Oglesby? Here. Director Paul? Here. Director Eisenhart? Here. Director Riley? Here. Director Edwards? Here. Vice Chair Anderson? Here. Chair Adams? Here. Thank you very much. And now let's have our Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please stand and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, in the middle of the United Thank you. Are there any additions and corrections to the agenda today? Thank you very much. Um, are there any, um, this is an opportunity now for public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board um, on uh, uh, information items or anything that is not on today's agenda, please come forward now and, uh, and make your comments. I see we have Mr. Raleigh coming to the mic. Good evening. Not addressing something that's on this agenda, but it was a closed session agenda. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> Again, Tom Raleigh, Vice President of Monterey Peninsula Taxpayer Association. Anyway, um, there's a real chance for some leadership to wrap up the water service charge and sunset it as is mandated by your own ordinances. You got the parcel tax was back, put back on, the per diem was put back on our water bills and you were obligated to sunset it. That was negotiated before most of you people were on the board. You were around, the mayor was around and you were around, but you were not on the board. But this was negotiated back in 2012, and I think it's about 2014. You guys got the uh, per diem charge restored, and you're obligated to sunset. And it's ridiculous that we had to go to court to get you to sunset it. It's time for the directors to take charge and tell your staff they're supposed to follow their own ordinance. It's ridiculous. You're not following your fiduciary duties as directors carrying out your own ordinance. Why? I can't figure it out. You have an efficient staff, but they should follow their own ordinances. When they don't, you're supposed to correct them. We were looking for some leadership. We have not seen the leadership from the elected officials, starting right with the chair. Very disappointing. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to uh, make comments uh, today under the oral communication segment of our meeting? Chair Adams, I do see Melody Chrislock with their hand raised. Excellent. Ms. Chrislock, um, could you please make your comments? Melody Chrislock, um, I attended the Salinas Chamber of Commerce meeting that Cal Am held today in Salinas on Zoom. And I was wondering what in the world Salinas was doing there um, to begin with, they have, you know, so they're there talking about the desal and talking, tell, explaining to Salinas the whole way our water system works here on the peninsula. Very puzzling stuff. I mean, <laughs> but something that was very unnerving is someone who was there in person was talking to people that were in the audience. And 
one of the people thought that Calam was a new water provider in the area. I thought, wow, this is really getting a bit strange. There were so many omissions in that presentation. <clears throat> they were asked how much the desal water would be per acre foot. No answer. Oh no, there was an answer. It was, they said, oh, it'll it'll be, they kind of dodged it and said, well, groundwater is a few hundred acre feet, you know, a few hundred dollars an acre foot, but this will be more like Monterey one. <laughs> no, <laughs> twice that maybe. Um, and there were just like, they started out by saying, well, the peninsula, you know, there's a thousand acre feet short. They didn't get to mentioning that that problem was already being solved for quite a while. And then it was just very odd for the, why were they in Salinas to begin with, telling everyone about the Monterey Peninsula water supply projects and the D cell. And then at one point they said, well, there'll be plenty of water for CSIP from the desal. And it's like, really? <laughs> Let's hope not. After uh, Casserville takes 700 acre feet and we pay for it, but <laughs> now they're planning on lots of water for CSIP. They didn't go so far as to say that they were actually planning to sell water to Cal Water for development, but some people seem to suspect that's what they're up to. Anyway, um, I wish that the water management district would maybe um, have a conversation with Cal Water and find out what they think Cal Am is promising them. I'm sure they have not admitted to Cal Water the kind of price they would be paying wholesale for this water if, if that is in fact what they're up to. It was just a little unnerving. The presentation was confusing. And, you know, I just don't I have no idea what people who knew nothing about it made of it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Krislock. Is there anyone else's hands raised to make comment on this uh, uh, time for public comment? I believe I see Michael Bear. Let me get there. Mr. Bear, you're up. Michael, can you hear us? I need to unmute him, I believe. Michael, can you hear us? To get the unmute button. Can you hear me? I can hear yes, you. Yes, we can now. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. I just spent the weekend in your lovely peninsula, and now I'm back in San Jose where it's 93 degrees in my backyard in the shade. Um, <laughs> and uh, so what a blessing, you know, to have that cool weather. Um, and I drove home this, this afternoon, uh, and Going by Del Monte and Sloat at Navy Postgraduate School, there um, was a water leak. Calam had a couple of its, I didn't see any Calam people. Just down the street, uh, PGE was doing major work on Del Monte as rush hour was beginning, getting you know down to one lane. I fortunately got past that before it got backed up. I'm sure traffic was bad today. But getting back to Del Monte and Sloat Navy Postgraduate School, that's got to be a major infrastructure intersection uh, right there at the corner. And um, I just want to remind you, you, you're dealing with a hundred year old system and you got no maintenance records whatsoever. So you don't know what you're going to be attempting to buy in the future. And just to raise the issue, that it may take longer to get there to the end. I know you don't want to do, you know, be spending the rest of your life doing this to get to discovery at part two of the trial, but it might be a good investment of time to know what kind of, you know, system you're buying. It's obviously way down the road, um, but I encourage you all to think about that aspect. And in other water news, there was a rain delay in the top of the eighth inning in Cincinnati. It's two to two. Giants have runners on second and third with one out, and they brought out the tarps. So the rain <laughs> is going to last in Cincinnati until I can hear Dave Laredo's report and then go watch the end of the game. If I'm, <laughs> I'm really lucky. But anyway, thanks again for all your work. 
and uh, looking forward to hearing as much information as possible about lawsuits and acquisitions, uh, et cetera. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael, and uh, stay cool. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other hands raised? Chair Adams, I see Susan Schiavone. Ms. Schiavone, if you'd like to uh, make sure you're unmuted and uh, you may make your remarks. Can you hear me? Because yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention two things this evening. Um, first, there was um, Mr. Raleigh encouraged the district to sunset the water supply fee. And I know I'm not sure if the CPUC has to do a decision in order for that to really happen, because I do believe the the fee, the uh, uh, water supply fee, the one that's collected on the bill, uh, the water charge, water supply fee, I think that's what you call it. Anyway, I believe that's designated for certain areas that have to do with conservation and mitigation. And so therefore, because that was legally done in that way, that puts some constraints on the water supply fee being used for uh, water supply. So I, I, if I'm, I know you're in a case, I don't know if you can comment it or not, but I think that unless that happens, then the, the water supply fee will have to still go on. Um, the other thing was that today's Calam presentation was definitely dissembling. We had a lot of vague information and, and really would not answer questions. I think some of you were there. I especially didn't like the answer uh, on one side. Mr. Stratton was saying how much the peninsula conserves water and they, they conserve it highly. Um, but then when I asked a question about lower middle class rate payers and the desal coming in and subsidizing even lower rate payers, how they were going to address that, his answer pretty much was just use less water. If you're not in an apartment, in an apartment, you're going to not have a big bill. But if you happen to be a homeowner and lower middle class, you just have to use less water. And that was, you know, I didn't I didn't care for his attitude about that. And then also he didn't really have any answers on questions that were of any substance at all. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Any other hands? Chair Adams, I see no other raised hands. Great, thank you very much. And no one else in, in uh, the chamber. So we will close public or oral communications and move forward. Um, and we will move forward with our first item today. And that is the uh, consent calendar. We have one item on the consent calendar and that is uh, to consider adoption of the minutes of the regular board meeting on June 20th, 23rd, uh, 2023. Um, is there any question or comment on this item of, con of uh, on the consent calendar from any board members? Any member of the public who wishes to comment on this one particular item in our consent calendar? Seeing none present, is there anyone whose hand is raised? Chair Adams, I see no raised hand. Seeing none, um, I take a motion to approve the consent calendar, please. I approve. Thank I you. I move to approve. I move to approve. And thank you very much. So we have a motion and a second. Could we have a um, roll call, please? Oh, I don't. Okay, great. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, please, all who in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Here, any abstentions? Hearing none, we will um, close the consent calendar. Uh, we pass that and we'll move on now to our general manager's report. We have a presentation by our general manager, thank David you, J. Stoltz. <laughs> it up on the screen. And who's going to be driving? Uh, there, there's a question about to be answered. Is this on? Is that the top one? 
Yeah. Yeah. Can you see anything? Oh, and yeah, you need this on your laptop. <laughs> Actually, Sarah. It will only talk to the laptop. Yeah, it's, it's talking to the drive that's not in the computer. Sorry about that. Sorry. Well, the title of this report is the status report on Kellen's compliance with the State Water Resources Control Board's orders and the Seaside Basin decision as of July 1, 2023. Go ahead, Sarah, next slide. Yeah, let's just uh, go ahead and advance it. Madam Chair, what's the, the universal symbol? <laughs> so let's see. We've got a couple of jokes we could tell here. Don't yeah. do any good water jokes? I don't know. Well, this was the shortest agenda of the year, and I thought, shape. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. We go. Okay. Okay. So this is um, the two resource areas: the river and the groundwater. Uh, compared to actual the target, we're still. Um, completely out of line with our quarterly water budgets because of the winter that we had, which wasn't originally anticipated. So this reflects nine months year to date, uh, the water year. But the previous three months, we anticipated very little table 13 water rights, uh, very little injection to ASR, and we subsequently had them. So the numbers don't line up very well, <clears throat> but I can tell you the Carmel River Basin uh, at 1411 is about 500 acre feet uh, in June. So we're now starting to see production from the normal water rights because when it's raining, you get table 13 water rights, you prioritize injection to ASR. Um, but now we're starting to see the, the actual Carmel River water right kick into place. Next slide. Looking at the uh, non-river, non-seaside groundwater, um, ASR recovery, you can see 206. Um, we at the district expected probably about 600 acre feet. It may, may end up being more like 900 of stored water taken out of uh, uh, the basin. And then Pure Water Monterey recovery, there was no recovery in uh, the previous two months because we hit our 3,500 uh, delivery total for the fiscal year. And then we had May and June, which were within the fiscal year that we didn't need to deliver company water. So we put all that water into the reserve, but now in the water year, we've got three more months of a water year, which is in a different fiscal year. So things don't always line up, um, but you'll begin to see uh, Pure Water Monterey recovery go back up for the remainder. And then you'll probably see an actual that's very close to 3,500 for the water year, as well as the fiscal year. And then uh, just a note, San City D cell uh, showed some productivity at almost full capacity for the for the month. Uh, next slide. This is the <clears throat> production for customer service or uh, water to serve demand. Uh, the middle column, PWM recovery, that's where you can see the two zeros. Um, so no water was derived from pure water. There was water injected, but it just went into the reserves for those months. The uh, seaside Basin, you can see, already exceeds the, the limit of 1474 for the year. So the company will find themselves in a position where they will have exceeded um, the, the mandatory step down of uh, 1474, which they can address through the already permitted replenishment assessments that the Monterey Pipeline allows them to do or there may be some carryover credit that's available from the alternate producers in the prior year. 
Um, but it's um, the Seaside Basin is hitting a, a, a point where it's starting to, to tap uh, beyond its permitted amount. And then finally, the total number, uh, we're at 289 acre feet better than last year. And last month we were 247 acre feet better than last year. And the month prior, we were just about 81, I believe, acre feet. So we're, you know, with three more months to go, we're actually still seeing demand in the systems lower than last year, which was lower than the prior year. And so even uh, coming back with a heat wave in July and August, I, I don't foresee that we're going to have significantly higher demand than in uh, prior years. So this attenuation, this flat eight-year period where customer demand seems to have leveled out, continues to hold, which is we'll obviously report back at the end of the, the water year. Uh, the next slide is pretty much redundant from last month. We did actually have some rain in June. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Which you can see that little tiny blue bar in early June, you know, less than a quarter <laughs> inch. Um, so the total, the red line didn't really change radically in June. Uh, next slide. Um, and you can see the dotted line is our current year. We will continue to end up in extremely wet, but not, um, I think last month I reported it was the sixth wettest year on record. And obviously the blue line at the top was the, the wettest year, uh, 1998. And then finally, stream flow. Uh, next slide. You can see that in June, the the blue bar is the actual exceeded the long-term average. And that's because the watershed is still releasing some of the, the heavy winter rains, which is a, a positive signal. Um, the river, some of the tributaries are starting to dry up, but the river continues to flow. And that concludes the compliance report. The next item, uh, an update on water supply projects, water supply planning committee requested that um, we reprise a presentation we did for them to the full board. Uh, this is a review of the ASR season performance. Uh, next slide, Sarah. So these are the system constraints. You have a, a paper copy of this in your uh, red uh, folder as well. Uh, system constraints on ASR injection, we covered at the beginning of the year that if we had access to the Monterey pipeline working bi-directionally, um, then our water permits would allow us uh, 29 acre feet uh, per day during the injection season. We don't have access to the Monterey pipeline and not all the wells are working perfectly anyway. So if we had the access to the Monterey pipeline, the well capacity would kind of top us out at 26 acre feet per day. But we don't have access to the Monterey pipeline. All the water that was injected came up over the hill through uh, Tehama and Montera. And so with no constraints on the injection field, we could do 19 acre feet previously, about 18 acre feet now that Ryan Ranch and Bishop have been connected to the, the system and aren't standing alone. So they take a little bit of water out of the, the, the system. So best we could do is about 18 acre feet with all the injection sites. We did not have use of all the injection sites this year because ASR3 was being used for recovery. ASR3 is part of a couplet with ASR well number four. So those two are plumbed together, which means neither was available for injection, creating a further limit of 13 acre feet per day with no constraints in the valley. And We'll talk a little bit about those valley constraints. And when there are constraints in the valley, like valley wells being offline or no new pump station, you will see in the data that four to five acre feet per day was what we were struggling to, to maintain. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So what you see here, the, the individual bars are actual performance. That's how much water was injected. The orange line is how much could have been injected if, uh, yes, uh, with uh, ASR three and four being unavailable. And then the green line is what could have been injected if ASR wells three and four were available. 
So what you need to focus in on is the white space, the gap between what was actually injected and what could have been injected with either the orange or the green line. Next slide, please. Oh my. Well, we'll just take a look at the paper version. Um, and so in early December, uh, we didn't get to full capacity because of what I would call startup hiccups. Everybody said they were ready, but when the day came, they needed a day to get all the valves and the, the valving working. And then you start up a little bit slowly. Same thing happened. Um, we ran out of our window of meeting our in-stream flow requirements, which is why it dropped back down to zero for several weeks. And then when the rains really started to hit late December, basically New Year's Eve or the day before New Year's Eve, um, that's when we were beginning the injection season in earnest, continuously all the way through the end of May. And so that little white gap are also some startup hiccups of just getting up to a uh, full injection. Then you can see a period of time. Um, you can almost make out the word flooding up on the screen, um, but a, a number of the Carmel Valley production wells were offline due to flooding. Um, you, you know, the Pasajano neighborhood got hit. Um, a bunch of wells in, the, in that region were, were out of service. And because we didn't have, or Calam didn't have the new pump stations working by that point in time, they couldn't compensate by pushing more water up the hill into the valley. So we had to back off our injection rate in order to serve the needs of the customers and to keep tank levels at safety uh, levels for fire flow. Then the next uh, white area is uh, the Pierce well was out, but the AT&T golf tournament was coming to town. And so there was the expectation of increased customer demand due to the tournament, a lack of really the largest well in the valley for production, the Pierce well. And so we agreed to back off injection to assure, again, tank levels and customer service. Then we had a pretty good period where you see the, the bars actually make it to the, the orange line and, and some days exceeded it. Um, but then there was this drop off again, and that was a period of time. Pierce was still out. The Schulte well was out and there were some leaks. Um, so the, the two new pump stations were tested. Calam is in effect reversing its system through Pacific Grove, Pebble Beach and the lower valley. By reversing the flow, a lot of uh, leaks were either caused or discovered. And so and the worst time to kind of um, diagnose leaks is when it's raining, too, because it's hard to tell, you know. <laughs> so it took a while to, to deal with the system problems that probably resulted as uh, directly from the testing of the two new pump stations. So the pump stations got energized or the one that needed to get energized. PG&E came out on an emergency basis. So in February, they were tested but a little too late to deal with the flooding that happened in January. So, you know, a mis mistiming. And then finally, the last little gap of white, uh, the Berwick well number eight went out and Pierce was still out and Schulte was still out. So what it underscores is the lack of redundancy, both in terms of uh, production wells here in the Seaside Basin side of things, so that the, they had to rely on ASR3 for producing pure water Monterey water and the lack of redundancy in the valley where you could have avoided some of these uh, cutbacks by pushing water up with the pump stations that weren't ready to go or having more production capacity, which they don't currently have. The Schulte wells being rehabbed. Um, there's another well being rehabbed, I think at Rancho San Carlos. Um, there's a new uh, Rancho Kenyatta well, which would be an additional redundant well that's not yet built. So a lot of these problems that we experience this year should likely go away. Um, if we can get extraction wells one and two at the school easement in Seaside done in a timely manner 
for the Pure Water Monterey expansion, then less reliance on ASR well number three, and it should be available during the next rainy season. So the next slide, please, Sarah. So what you have, you know, this actual versus optimized results, you know, we calculated what it cost us, um, and there's kind of two pieces to every one, not having ASR three and four available for injection, or not having a Carmel Valley uh, a pertinent or feature available. So the flooding of the upper Car Carmel Valley wells probably cost us about 167 acre feet. Uh, Pierce out the concern over demand during the AT&T Golf Week and Schulte out another 118 acre feet. Uh, the, the leaks and maintaining tank levels with Pierce and Schulte out about 264 acre feet, significant period. And the Berwick uh, number eight issues just under 100 acre feet, and then other, which is just those startup issues and so forth. So grand total, uh, just under 1,200 acre feet kind of left on the table, if you will. And it's just for a variety of different operational reasons. Uh, next slide. Wow. Just some very odd change in format. Um, <laughs> So even with the various Carmel Valley constraints, we did have um, a number of days where you could, you could see on the chart that we actually met the orange line, meaning we maxed out. So there were no problems in the Carmel Valley. The problem was only ASR three and four. So had we had ASR three and four um, over these the first 17 day period, then a 49 day period, those 66 days would have gotten us another 330 acre feet. So the problem really is split between injection capacity here on the north side of the divide and production capacity in the Carmel Valley side. And both of which, um, you know, kind of resulted in a problem. Let's take hot luck on how the next slide looks. Oh, good. Um, so the actual injected was uh, 1,656 acre feet. Without the injection constraints, we could have been at 1,986 acre feet. Without the Carmel Valley constraints, but with the injection cons constraints, we could have been just over 2,000. And with neither constraint, we could have been at about 2,808 um, or 2,808. Um, so we did leave water uh, in the river that we really would have loved to have had. Um, in the earlier report, I mentioned 206 acre feet of withdrawal from the ASR bank already this water year. So it would have been nice to have that additional 1100. Um, I think moving forward, what this really underscores for us is, um, next slide, is, um, Go ahead and click. Yeah, I don't know what. Uh, well, what could we have done? Um, the startup hiccups, these are really small amounts, but uh, be ready to set the valves the day before it rains, not the day it really starts raining, the first day into your permit uh, regime. Um, the flooded upper valley wells, as I said earlier, more lower valley redundancy, which I do see coming, um, hopefully. And having those pump stations online when needed would have been helpful. I'm, you know, the new, more, new Carmel Valley pump station was pretty much ready to go in July, but it doesn't function without water being pushed up to it from the Forest Lake Tanks pump station, which, you know, there was a filing to the Public Utilities Commission that showed it should have been ready to go by late fall, um, a far better time to test them. You know, when there's no rain on the ground, there's no ASR season, um, that would have been fortuitous. And then of course, you know, the Pierce well going out just underscores the need for other wells in the valley to, to make up the production. So as I said, a number of these uh, hopefully go away before the next injection season, um, certainly, additional capacity for extraction in the northern seaside basin area has to happen in order to make pure water expansion work. So worst case, it's a, you know, a two-year build out. 
but new wells shouldn't take a full two years. It, it could be done within a year. So it'd be nice to get those prioritized by the company so that we'd have greater injection capacity by December. But I think things move slowly. Um, we've seen in all of our filings with the PEC that some small capital projects take almost two rate case cycles to actually get completed, which is, you know, that's two, three year cycles. Mm. So there's just kind of a slow, um, just, you know, it's not as fast as we would like it, but we don't control it. And that concludes that. The other item in the general manager's report, I think was pretty thoroughly covered in the staff note. I did include a statement on the strategic goals that were adopted uh, and where we stand on them. Uh, there are a couple in there that we just haven't gotten started on. But generally speaking, I think we're making good progress. So unless you have specific questions from the, the packet, um, we'll just leave it as a written report. Okay, thank you very much for that. I will come to the board to ask for comments or questions, but I have one for you to start with um, regarding the um, the problems that we had and the lost water that we experienced. We are going to have, it sounds as if we're going to have another really wet season this year. So what can we do to help ensure that these things don't happen? What can we do to make sure that everything is in order so we don't lose so much water to the yeah. great blue sea. Well, you know, it's an, it's a great partnership. And I should add that, you know, to the boots on the ground, um, Callum staff did great. Our staff did great. The coordination was great. There were a lot of weekend calls. Hey, can you back it off? We've got a you know, tank level problem. Um, good communication on almost a daily basis as to what was injected the prior day and so forth. So it comes down to trying to ensure that uh, there's sufficient well capacity in the valley and the two rehabilitation projects should come online you know they're they're much slower than what we expected but um you know we're told that schulte's coming within a couple of months um the new rancho kenyatta additional well which we would be a redundant well i'd like to see them the you know the company prioritize some of these projects and just get them done. Um, we, we can't really control that. Pump stations are online, they work, so that won't happen again. Um, and then, you know, the best case over here would be to get the two, first two of four wells for Pure Water Monterey expansion, get going and hopefully get those up and that will free up some of the load from ASR three and four. So, but these are all construction schedules and project management that is on Calam's side of the equation, not ours. So, I guess the, the follow-up question would be: So, how can we nudge them? You know, are we? I'm sure you're. You know, I know that. Well, you, I see Chris is on right now and Josh is on right now. So good. consider the nudging started. <laughs> okay, excellent. Good, good. Let me see if we have any com questions or comments from our board. Just one, one yes. comment. Mm -hmm. the, the, the water you. supply committee um, asks that you pre present this in the, at a board meeting also because it's important that the public understand that although oh, the uh, 15 or 1600 acre feet uh, was recovered uh, during that, that very, during the last ASR season, um, that it could have been quite a bit better. Uh, and you know, you, I thank you for explaining all the constraints and the reasons why. And um, and the, I think it's important that the public understand that had the um, the redundancy been uh, built sooner, the necessary redundancy, and those projects moved that are really needed moved more quickly, and had you know, other things been done, um, it could have been much better. I, I just think in the um, presentation Calam did today for the Salinas uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, what was accomplished was just, you know, presented as a great feat and the Calam was ready, but it, not, it, 
in reality, in some respects, it was not. And so I think I thank you for doing that. So the public and the, uh, knows that. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Um, yes, uh, picking up on what uh, our chair mentioned about El Nino is coming, so more water is expected. So I'm just trying to look at these dips, the chart that has the gap, the white space between the blue um, uh, production numbers. Uh, so the startup hiccups probably can be eliminated. That's only a small area. You don't expect the same level of uh, water, so I don't think, think you expect flooding, so you, you don't expect that to be an interference. What about these uh, uh, pumping stations that were out during this during the period here? Are they all kind of They're, functioning now? They are. Um, those are the two. That, in order to kind of shift the whole system from a south to north system, the Farmo River pushing water up to the north to accommodate Pure Water Monterey, and you know if there ever is a desal plant from the north. You need to move water from the north to the south. So you bring it out um, through the Monterey pipeline, which gets it to the uh, the Erdley pump station or that circle where in Pacific Grove where Erdley comes in. Um, and then from there, there's a, a, a pipeline that takes it to Forest Lake inside Pebble Beach. There's a pump, a brand new pump station right near the Forest Lake tanks that then pushes that water up the hill through the forest at Pebble and then through Carmel and then up where you make the turn for uh, ran well, Rancho San Carlos Road, which if you were headed to Quail uh, or the big dog walking park there <laughs> that people use it for, um, or if you're going to the preserve. So right there is another pump station brand new that was kind of ready to go in the middle of summer, but it's partnered down at Forest Lake wasn't ready to go. And, you know, I'll tell you, getting PG&E to do anything has been a challenge. You know, we had trouble getting them to come out and energize the uh, ASR project, however many years ago that was for the, the middle school part. Um, so in some respects, having the flooding allowed Calam to say, hey, this is an emergency. Hmm. And they came and they powered up. So in some respects, I'm not sure we would have gotten the Forest Lake <laughs> pump station powered up if there hadn't been some flooding of the wells further up the hill. So, but those are now available. Some of the leaks that were discovered, um, you know, I would imagine there will still be more when we reverse the flow again. Um, so, you know, the company's going to have to deal with some of that. We've seen, I think we've seen more reported uh, leakage in the Carmel area here in the last couple of months than we've seen in you know, a couple of years. So I, I think that there definitely was an impact there. Um, just uh, as a follow-up, my, my, uh, I can see our goal being, I'm getting on the same chart about the, uh, is meeting the orange line, uh, which is without full capacity, but fill in the gaps where we do have the capacity. Yeah. And uh, even with less rain, we may end up with more water. Absolutely. Right, okay. Yeah. The goal is to meet the orange line. You got to fix all the mistakes that were made in the Carmel Valley. To meet the green line, we need a couple more extraction wells here in the seaside base. And, and I did ask a question, but I don't remember the answer, uh, partly because I wasn't happy with it. But um, I asked Cal Am about the schedule on uh, the uh, extraction well, their, their side of the extraction wells. And then the last I heard was, well, working on it or something like that. Yeah. Is that your, is that what you would say too? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, one, of, one of their engineering staff, Tim O'Halloran, gave a little more positive vibe on the extraction wells than previously. So they are in conversation with the school district. I think there was some question about, are you sure there's no alternative sites? Mm -hmm. um, which there really aren't uh, compared to the, Location. So where the, the first two extraction wells for expansion are kind of on the border of the middle school and Bayonet and Black Horse. So kind of behind the sports fields, relatively innocuous location. But, you know, the superintendent wants to make sure that you can't go put them somewhere else. I don't 
I think that has been answered at this point, but I know they're they're having discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Uh, General Manager, Major J. We put out a timeline earlier. I think that timeline possibly needs to be updated. When can we get that to the public so they know what's going on with Major J? I know you're working on it. I just want to keep the public informed of yep. what's going on. Yeah, so you may have seen uh, a schedule for review and a special meeting and so forth. The there's a document that's going to general counsel. He and Fran will work on it, massage it. Then it'll go to our special counsel. They'll have about two to three weeks. So we're, we're looking at your decision, um, but we're looking at a meeting, a special meeting in the first week of September for you to decide if a if you want to schedule a uh, hearing of public necessity, a hearing of necessity and B, when that would be. Um, right now, I think we're kind of targeting the regularly scheduled September board meeting, um, make it a very limited agenda and then open to public hearing. But it has to get noticed differently than other uh, meetings. The company would have a, a right to appear and address certain questions. And so all of that will be discussed with you, uh, less so, but I guess, um, at the August board meeting, I can bring back a schedule that we can throw up on the screen and let the public see. I, I appreciate that. And I think the public will, so they can set the calendars and, and be there. That's an important meeting. So thank you. Yep. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Let's take it out to the public and see if there's any member of the public who wishes to comment on anything in the general manager's report. Chair Adams, I see Michael Bear. Thank you very much, Mr. Bear. Hi, um, thank you for that excellent report, Dave. That was really very clear uh, presentation of the challenges and, um, you know, the coordination that has to happen between the company and the district, just that you're on the calls with the company instead of just dealing with it in-house, as we all hope might happen one day. I just had to... I just had to say, you know, I'm wondering if that's what I saw today, leaving town, right? The reversal, the moving of north to south, creating a major leak down by the Navy Postgraduate School where they used to say they had problems in the past, a, 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 a gravity thing. That's why they needed to have a pump, you know, and that was part of the reason for the pipeline in the first place. But, uh, you know, the pipeline did not go down Del Monte as originally scheduled and went down Fremont. This is older structure, but now because you're reversing the flow from uh, south back to north and sending the water backwards, maybe you know this is related to that because 500 feet down the road there was a big PG&E truck, you know, working on the wires. So uh, it just seemed like I wanted to mention that, and thank you for the opportunity to mention that, and it ties into my earlier comment about what's going on with the infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Bear. Is there, are there any other hands raised? Thank you, and no one in the chambers wishes Madam to Chair, make a comment? Um, yes. So I'm just reminded with Michael speaking, there is one change to the minutes oh. that Sarah is on top of and she's got, but in, in the very first um, oral communications, Michael Bear was spelled like a bear, not correctly <laughs> his name. Bear. And then uh, Marley Melton pointed that one out. She also pointed out some wording choices in the uh, agenda item 4-1 or the exhibit 4-A. Um, but those wording changes can't be made because these are the goals as you've adopted them. So I so, yeah, was reminded. Thank you for making that those comments. Um, I have a couple of people who wish to make comments again, back to the board. So we'll go first to Ian, then to. Oh, and she just, I think, and just as an example, I, I said something like uh, about luring qualified employees, and she suggested recruiting. <laughs> just not going to be. No, so. No, it would have improved it had we seen her comments back in March. 
Anything else, Mr. Oglesby? No, I, I do want to say I appreciate the uh, general manager with the explanation of the challenges that we face now and that for the public to folks that they want to come across. Appreciate that. Thank you. And I just want to thank the Water Supply Committee for voting to bring this to the full yeah, board's attention. It, um, it's, it's, it was nicely done, the presentation, and it raises, I think, awareness to the whole board and the public uh, on what we need to solve before the next rainy season. Great. Thank you. Ms. Anderson, any comments? Yes. Ms. Yes, I have one. Um, also, that bears both on the uh, goals, the report, on the status report on the goals and objectives, and on the presentation you just made about the ASR optimization. Or, or um, I noticed too that in our well, first of all, I want to thank you for doing the report, the the assessment of where we're at with the goals and objectives. As a board member, I find that very, very helpful. Too. Um, to be reminded of all the goals and objectives and our priorities, to have a, a point to know where things are at, more or less. I just what find we it, were thinking. Yes, what we were thinking, and um, and it yes, it it um, it reminds us of why we made chose these priorities, okay. and um, and to know how we're doing. It, it's really really helpful. So thank you for this uh, update on how we're doing. I noticed one thing that relates to the um, optimization of our facilities issue that you know was a big issue in the ASR report you just gave us, which is, so our goal number five is, to, is about near-term water supply. Continue our planning for near-term water supply, including operation optimization. And under that goal, the first objective is um, includes to ensure optimization of existing supplies and facilities. That's what we'd like to be able to do, but as you explained so well, that's not really possible. Not I mean, what we should us. have said is to the extent possible with CalAM ownership, yeah. because <laughs> we, we don't own all, all, all of the facilities, the essential facilities, we can't, build them out as quickly as we like. We don't maintain them. We don't test them. Uh, we don't prioritize which resources. So we would like to see existing supplies and facilities optimized, but in the current situation with Calam ownership, that's not really possible. Right. Well, and, and keep in mind that the, the near-term problem is until the expansion comes online, the firm resources that we have are about 1300 acre feet short of the demand. So you're going to be relying on ASR, either stored ASR water or in that year, water that you can save during the winter and get in the summer. But when we headed into this winter after two years of drought, we only had stored about 1300 acre feet. If your shortfall is 1300, you didn't have a lot in the bank. So now we've got about 3,000 in the bank or a little under 3,000 minus the 200 that was taken last month. So we can get through the construction period. But a lot of this emphasis on prioritizing near term was you've got to have as much table 13 as you can get when it rains. And make hay when the sun shines, make yeah. table 13 when it rains. You've got to you know, let's move that new source well for the Sand City desal plant as far forward as possible. And if it's being held up by division of drinking water permitting issues, you know, somebody's got to reach through that and get it addressed so that you can get as much water from Sand City desal. These are the near-term requirements to just cover that shortfall every year. And so, you know, as I've more than once said, Praying for rain is not a strategy, but it worked out pretty well for us this year. Um, but as John Lear likes to say, what you really need to make ASR work, and the reason it worked so well here was, yeah, it's like a, a decent rainstorm every 10 days. And so you've saturated the watershed, you've filled and spilled at the dam, 
and it just keeps coming. You're, you're, you, you meet your in-stream flow requirements on a daily basis. And so that's what happened here from December 30th to May 31st was just a continuous procession of available flow in the river. So then you have to change your focus on how do I make sure I can get that flow because you had the you had the the permit conditions met on a just perfectly on a daily basis. So right. may not may not always get that. Thank you for that expansion. That was uh, very well done. Okay, so um, we've gone to public comment. Yes, Mr. Riley. One, one, oh, I'm sorry, I kind of skipped over the last <laughs> two folks down there, didn't I? Uh, one question on the evaluation uh, comments on uh, goal number one is the uh, pure water expansion. Um, can you just remind us of the schedule that might, that you can kind of anticipate about lifting the CDO in the moratorium? Yeah, so the plan was to award you know, there were two contract packages, bid packages, one for the plant improvements out at the regional treatment plant and one for the injection well facilities. There's some question now whether Monterey One Water may throw out all the injection well facility bids. Due to, they, they threw it out. That's coming up on July 20th. They're yeah. going to throw them out. Yeah, mm. right. It's yeah. in the agenda. Yeah, it's on the agenda for July. Um, which could be a little hiccup, but it's a 24 month build. So the idea was, Award July 31st, mobilize maybe by late August, and then 24 months later, you're flipping the switch, give or take delays in construction and supply chain issues. So if they do the rebid, we may lose a couple of months. And then even if it's online and producing water, whenever the, you know, they cut the ribbon for that, uh, I think you said there's some delay part uh, uh, Delay procedure at the uh, state water board. Level. Well, yes and no. Um, our intent is to start that discussion with Calan and be ready to go to the state water board mid construction. Okay. So a year out. Okay. Simultaneously, as I was telling Marlena earlier, is to get our allocation process going so that the jurisdictions know how much water they'll be working with. Um, that'll be probably 10 months from now-ish. Um, we're just wrapping up a memorandum on what the proper CEQA approach to the allocation process. Um, so we want to have all of that kind of queued up midway in the construction process. So then if it takes a year for the State Water Board to act, but, you know, we have to, it, it's going to be easier with CalAM on board. Um, I know that the business coalition and others are very concerned about um, removing barriers to home building and job creation as quickly as possible. So I think we'll you know, be looking at a coalition of people who would, as I've been trying to tell people, whether you think pure water Monterey expansion is the last water or just interim water, it's our best chance to lift the moratorium sooner because it, there's still so many conditions that are going to be difficult to meet for the desal project. So get on board with the expansion, promote the lifting of the CDO, file the advice letter to lift the moratorium, and take a victory. But we'll see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, actually, I've closed public comment on this um, particular item, and it brought it back. This has brought board. up something new. Be my guest. Thank you. Um, looking ahead at getting off of the CDO, um, a couple things on construction, on what's planned on the residential housing, need to be taken into account. I happen to catch the front of the uh, San Francisco Chronicle at the post office today which there was a proposal with these new requirements for the building that the state has legislated, the Regional Housing Needs Authority, um, for a 25-story building that's going to be opposed. But the organization that is drumming up interest against this in San Francisco is Our Neighborhood Views. Who is Our Neighborhood Views? If you haven't looked at it, you should, because it's going to affect all the housing 
that's on the board that's being responses by the different cities for housing to meet the needs by the regional housing needs authority this is rippled through all the whole state this is generated primarily out of southern cal basically it's a state constitutional amendment which will put local jurisdictions in charge of their housing and take it out of the san francisco legislators in sacramento which we're now trying to bounce and this is affecting all the water that's coming up that's going to be used in the next eight years supposedly the the term of it and so this is coming up and you're going to hear more about it there are a few uh, jurisdictions in northern cal that supported this but it's primarily out of the southern cal area right now our neighborhood views it's a website and you need to take a look at it there's some very very strong people that are leading this elected officials and mayors in southern california and if i had to bet i think that the has stands a good chance of passing and our local jurisdictions would be then in control of housing again which i think would be a good thing it affects everything you're talking about on future water use thank you mr ravi okay i'm coming back to our item uh, which was to uh, get a status report uh, from the general manager and he touched on three different yeah. subjects We've had discussion, we've had public discussion, and um, we don't need to make a take a motion on this. We merely need to accept the report. And with that, we say thank you so much, Dave. The work you do is just amazing. So very, very pleased. Okay, and now we will go um, back to our um, district council and uh, get an update on pending litigation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, these are two items. I'm going to close, uh, combine them together. Items five and six. Uh, six is reportable action on closed session, and then number five is an update on pending litigation. Uh, taking the closed session items, uh, two items were on the agenda: the conference with legal counsel concerning the uh, LAFCO uh, lawsuit. Uh, that's where the uh, uh, district is challenging the LAFCO's decision uh, on the uh, exercise of latent powers. And then uh, the other item was the uh, Monterey Peninsula Taxpayers Association lawsuit against the Water Management District, uh, which is now pending appeal. Uh, as to both items, there was general direction provided. Uh, there was a discussion of options and alternatives, and those options and alternatives are going to be presented to litigation counsel for discussion with opposing counsel, but there is no reportable action. At this meeting, I anticipate that there will be reportable action in the August meeting on this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, with respect to the uh, remaining items of pending litigation, there's a companion case of the Monterey Peninsula Taxpayers Association against the district concerning the, uh, uh, the water supply charge. Uh, that's known as the reverse validation action. That matter has been trailing while the, uh, uh, the primary action on the uh, uh, implementation of the sunset clause has been litigated. Uh, there is a case management conference set before uh, the, the, the Superior Court in this second matter uh, for August 4th. And so we'll see at that time what the timeline is for the matter being uh, litigated. It is very likely that the matter will be trailed while the uh, matter is on appeal. That's, of course, subject to the discretion of the judge. Um, Monterey Peninsula uh, Water Management District against LAFCO. Uh, there is trial on the merits is set for August 7th before Judge Wills. Uh, that is the next step in that case. Uh, we're anticipating that uh, a decision will be uh, issued at, uh, at that time or shortly thereafter to uh, determine uh, what uh, the status of the LAFCO decision was. Um, the district is involved in a lawsuit against the California Coastal Commission that's titled Marina uh, versus California Coastal Commission. And that is challenging Cal Lamb's uh, coastal development permit. Uh, the, the state of California on behalf of the Coastal Commission did uh, file a demur challenging one of the causes of action that were uh, set forth in that. That demur was to have been heard on July 14th, two days before the hearing, the Coastal Commission dropped 
the demur extraordinarily frustrating because it has had been fully briefed, uh, but they, uh, the, the Attorney General, General's office withdrew their demur. So in essence, the, uh, the lawsuit chan stands as, as presented and will continue uh, through the next step of the litigation process. You ask, what is that next step? We don't know. Uh, the, uh, we have a uh, case management conference set in that matter for August 22nd. And at that time, the judge will be reviewing the status of the record, record protect, uh, 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 production. The Coastal Commission is insisting that they and only they can prepare the record and we are next in queue, whatever the, that is. And we are anticipating, or they are anticipating that the record will not be produced until the end of this calendar year. We have uh, suggested that we can prepare the record and submit it, uh, and we can do it in a much more uh, expedited fashion. The Coastal Commission's position is no, only they can prepare the record. So that will be one of the topics that we are discussing before the judge, who pre prepares the record and when. And then once the record is actually produced, then what is the next step in the process? We don't know. So stay tuned on that. Um, the last set of litigations that I want to report on is before the Public Utilities Commission, and that is the uh, case challenging CalAMS 2022 general rate case. The ALJ uh, finally has set a, uh, the, the hearing dates in that matter. All the hearings will be conducted remotely. Uh, we have eight days of hearings that have been set spread over five different weeks. <clears throat> the most we have are two days consecutive at any one time. <clears throat> Often they're separated by a day in between and sometimes they're just a day here and a day there, but those will begin September 19th and the last of the eight days is October 16th. And uh, we don't yet know who will be testifying when that is all to be resolved in the not too distant future. Um, that concludes the report on pending litigation. Thank you very much. I'll take it to the board for questions or comments. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Laredo. Yes, sir. Do the board have to discuss, I think probably an open session or closed session, on filing a complaint against the PUC on supply and demand? That case has been drug dragging on, I believe the public deserve an answer. Can we file a complaint, have an open discussion, or do we have to have that in closed session, or can we do it you, anyway? You, when, it's, when it's on the agenda, you can have that in open session. You could do this in closed session as well. This is a map, this is an issue that is before the PUC, but it's in the PUC black hole. Ostensibly, they, they were going to have a phase where they will be, ruling on supply and demand that is not yet on calendar and that's uh <laughs> here can we just file a complaint go on record I, as following a complaint yeah, if I the would, board agree on that i do not believe you can file a complaint the matter is not yet ripe to be heard in a court of law okay we have to exhaust our administrative remedies we have to go before the Public Utilities Commission. There are procedures that we can follow to compel the PUC to push it along. Can we, we discuss those? Yes, we can. Okay. Can we can we get it agendized? Or do we have to do that in public or closed session? Because we, we need to move on that one. Yes. Uh, I would suggest that we start in closed session. And then if you want, we can go into open session on that. Yeah. Through the chair, if, if possible, at our next closed session, I'd like to have that added, if we can. That we'll is so. the closed session agenda? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other board member question, comments, before just, I take it out to the public? Yes. Yeah, just one. Um, would that be a good, would our next closed session meeting be a good time to report on the other CPUC case, the rulemaking about acquisition of water utilities, I, or not? My sense is that it would be premature to have that discussion at that time. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, let's take it out to the public. Is there any member in the um, room who wishes to make comments on this item? Chair okay. Adams, I, ha I see Michael Bear. Michael, is that a legacy hand or is this another comment? <laughs> another comment. Okay. <laughs> Quick though, just a question for council. Who is the presiding judge? What is the jurisdiction for the Coastal uh, Commission case? And then if, if you guys actually bought the company out, you wouldn't have to deal with the CPUC at all related to water administration. Is that correct? Those are my two questions. Uh, the, uh, the Coastal Commission case, uh, that is before uh, Judge Wills. And uh, that has, he, he is the judge that is assigned to that matter. Uh, with respect to the Public Utilities Commission, if the district does own the facilities, the district is not subject to the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission for rates and charges or capital investment. So the PUC would no longer have any role with respect to the district's management of that system. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, see no additional hands raised. I will close this item. So uh, we will. Chair Adams. Oh, sorry. I see Marlene Melton. Okay, I'm so sorry. I didn't see that. Yes, Ms. Melton. There we go. There she is. Um, yes, I wanted to comment on the uh, left, um, sorry, the uh, appeal of the taxpayers um, case uh, that affected um, the water supply charge. And I noticed the large number of dollars that support really important public benefits that can no longer be conducted without this funding. And I hope that that point can be made. And I, uh, also it appears that um, staff time and the important work of the staff and the jobs the staff are doing may could be at some risk without this source of funding. So uh, it's not only jobs, but good people who are doing great work for the community and producing a lot of public benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Milton. Are there any other hands raised? Chair Adams, I see no other raised hands. Great, okay. Well, we have had items number five and six um, from uh, Mr. Laredo, and we will accept those um, presentations um, unless there is any opposition. Seeing none, we will move forward. And the next item is uh, oral reports on any activities uh, from the directors, including AB 1234, reports on trips, conference attendance, and meetings. I knew it would be Mr. Riley. <laughs> He's so diligent about reporting well. Well, I was, his... I was on the Zoom meeting today with, with Cal Am, interesting. Um, that's not really my report. Uh, the uh, Watermaster had a committee meeting on the uh, planning for uh, addressing the overdraft in the uh, seaside groundwater basin. And the committee recommended that a consultant be retained to look at alternatives for source water um, and if possible, get some cost estimates about what may be in the ballpark of those estimates. Uh, I've been in conversation with our general manager on some of these issues. This seems consistent with some concerns that we share, and, and I'm just looking forward to the results of that. Great. Thank you for taking taking that up. Any other reports from uh, directors? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I attended that meeting, um, Zoom meeting, with um, Councilman Paul, I mean, Director Paul and hmm. Director Riley and a few more of our citizens out there on uh, Salinas Valley. Um, it was uh, interesting, you know, some of the things we've been talking about tonight, Cal Am already is, is making up their mind that they, they're probably opposed, so we probably go ahead along, it was stated in that meeting. I also attended the Seaside City Council meeting, bring them update on ASR and other things we do it, doing. And I also attended uh, Councilman Dave Pacheco have a little committee, uh, a little citizen meeting that I turned to and talked about Major J a little bit on. Uh, July 20th is the Recycle Water Committee for Monterey One. All those things that the GM been talking about, the wells and, and, and approving a contract 
is going to be on that one for their committed recycle committee to hear it. And, you know, they even got stuff on there, even talking about inspecting the outfall and, and stuff. So you might want to tune into that. Uh, and that's all I got, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, no other comments from... Uh... Uh, can, I, can I just add just one other thing? Sure, just on of the course you master, can. Yeah. Uh, part of the discussion was who might be the consultant. And they're interested in the consultant that serves the uh, Salinas Valley GSA because they will already have done some modeling and some research and it, it may be a, a quick, a quicker um, mm -hmm. review because somebody's already familiar with our area. I just that's say interesting. That, 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 that's what they're exploring right now. Very interesting. Thank you for that. I uh, yes. Um, yeah, just a quick comment on the uh, the Zoom meeting of the where uh, the Salinas Chamber of Commerce invited Calam to report on the water supply situation on the Monterey Peninsula. Um, it seemed to me the presentation was targeted to a group of people that had not been following the water supply situation in Monterey, or interested but probably didn't know very much about it. So what jumped out at me is most of all is the important things that Calam did not say. The things that important things that they didn't say, such as how much would desalination water cost if the desal plant gets built. He mentioned he, he the presenter said it's expensive. It's more expensive than any other source, but he he wouldn't. He wouldn't venture, I guess, as to the cost. Um, as he mentioned that the Coastal Commission had imposed 20 conditions, about 20 conditions uh, for the desal plant, but he didn't say anything about what's the likelihood of, of the company being able to meet those 20 conditions. I mean, I, I have a memory of many of them and uh, it seems to me there's, it's very possible that it, that it will not be possible for the company to meet all of those conditions. Several of them depend on the outcome of litigation, which is unknown and could take years. So I'll just leave it at that. I feel like we should ask to have equal time. <laughs> um, okay, no other comments on uh, this item number seven. I'll ask the public if there's any comments they wish to make on this item. Chair see. Adams, I do see Melody Chrislock. Okay. Melody Chrislock. Um, so, yes, you know, it would be a great idea um, if maybe the Water Management District and Marina both made some presentations to the Salinas Chamber of Commerce to fill in all those omissions <laughs> that were made. And, you know, if Calam is still listening here, um, would you please stop saying that your desal is permitted? It is not permitted, you know it's not. It has to go back to the Coastal Commission after meeting the 20 conditions to get a permit. And yet you continue to say it's been permitted. This is an outright, why? Yeah, so I really appreciate your um, your comments, but actually this is the the actual item that we're talking about is oral reports on activities of the board of the board members. I'm good. So very much appreciate it, but I, I, we're not going to be able to continue on there. Any other um, questions or comments? Um, and so, um, Michael, Mr. Bear, I see your hand is still up and I hope that you just heard my re remarks. So um, if you have some comment to make on uh, um, any of the director's attendance at, co at meetings, that would be accepted, but that's gonna be about it. All right. Um, I, was, I thought we were at the end of the meeting. I didn't realize the previous comment. No. I was gonna make a comment. I was just said, still raining in Cincinnati, didn't miss a pitch. <laughs> have, a nice, have a nice evening. A nice thank evening. you very much. So okay. All right. thank, thank, thank you. you. All totally right. agree. Um, okay, we'll uh, close this right. item then. And uh, we see that we have our regular informational items from the staff, which everyone has the opportunity to read and review. Um, final comments? Yes. I do have a comment on the informational items. I know this is silly, but... It's 
I, I have a comment. Okay. Um, and maybe this is me being old school. I'm, 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 I am a little uncomfortable with a couple of, um, of the minutes. Uh, this is item nine, the committee reports, right? Um, every time we talk about a member of this board, it's Director Riley or Chair Adams. When I hear Mr. Uh, Council Laredo talking about the court, it's Judge Wills, Judge Panetta, and I, I really think that's appropriate. I mean, we are a governmental body, and when we refer to other members of other governmental bodies, I think a modicum, just a little bit of respect. So on pages 43 and 47 of your packet are two committee reports that simply refer to the Honorable Judge Carrie Panetta as Panetta. And I, I, I'm, I don't like that. Um, I, she's Judge Panetta. She's earned that job. She was appointed by the governor. Um, and so can we just have a, I, I know that maybe when we speak in shorthand, but once it gets into paper, um, actually I would make a motion to amend those two minutes to <laughs> stick on pages 43 and 47, Judge Panetta before her name. Um, if that's inappropriate, that's fine, but certainly going into the future. Forward. I, I see no reason why we couldn't entertain that as a motion. To the chair, we, we, I don't think we need a motion for okay. that. Okay. General direction. General direction. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I'll take it as a typo. Okay. I'm sure that's what Thank it was. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate your, yeah, exactly. your willingness to uh, get the, get it done, but uh, in a bit of a different, uh, different avenue going in. I, I, I know that was the case. <laughs> I actually don't have anything well, pending. No. I have nothing pending before the honorable. What is <laughs> happening to my meeting here? We were all doing so well, and now it seems to have declined into something beyond this. Okay, so thank you very much for all of these comments. I think at this point I will um, adjourn the meeting, and the time is seven twenty-six.